Hello, and welcome to this module on diversity, inclusion, and cultural humility. I am Dr. Namdi Moiteke with the Department of Community and Public Health at Idaho State University. At the end of this module, you'll be able to define equity, diversity, and inclusion from a 21st century perspective, distinguish between cultural competence and cultural humility, describe the awareness continuum and your current position on it, and demonstrate vulnerability through self-reflection. We'll begin with the first unit, which is diversity, cultural humility, and the awareness continuum. In this unit, we'll focus on dimensions of diversity, cultural humility, and both self and other awareness. Diversity can be better understood by looking at the diversity wheel, which represents the multiple layers of identities that we all have. There are the primary dimensions or core identities, and these identities are closest to the core of a person's personality because these are identities that we were either born into or that we carried the longest throughout the course of our lives. So they include gender or sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, national origin, age, physical or other abilities. There are four primary races here in the United States, white, black, Asian, American Indian or Alaska native, and native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. There are also those who are multiracial, having two more races. Hispanic and Latinx is an example of an ethnicity rather than a race, because one can be racially white, but also be ethnically Hispanic or Latinx. The same goes for identities such as the difference between Black and African American. One's race may be Black, but one's ethnicity may be African American, Caribbean, or one of the various ethnic groups of Africa. Secondary dimensions represented here by the orange ring are a little away from the core. And these include socioeconomic status, veteran status, education, marital status, religion, geographic location, parental status, belief systems and values. These identities change the most and during stages of one's life. And it's during these stages that you may notice that these different identities also have their own cultures. For example, when one becomes a parent, their personality often changes. Their belief systems and value changes, values changes, as well as their attitudes and habits. The new parents may discover that there was a parental culture they didn't know existed before. It's important to note that though religion can change throughout the course of one's life, some authors consider it a primary dimension because of the impact that religion has in shaping one's belief systems and values. Some authors also add a third layer, the tertiary dimensions. These are furthest from the core of the individual. They include things like hobbies and interests, non-profits or volunteer involvement, political or social cause involvement, life experiences, and so on. These are the furthest from the core because they are often situational and change the most throughout the course of one's life and so may not have as much of an impact on one's perspectives, experiences, or interactions. Importantly though, is that the cultures that are specific to certain identities may only be salient to those who are members of that identity-based group. This diversity will helps to describe how all of us are multi-layered. So what percentage of these identities do you think are hidden? The answer is 95%. Appearance is the only identity that is not hidden. And that's only the case if one does not have a visual impairment. So inclusion is an awareness that all of us are a series of hidden identities. And if diversity has several dimensions, then inclusion is about not only these dimensions, 
but also about their interactions. For example, socioeconomic status and education intersect. And the sense that many pursue education to increase their socioeconomic status is also there. So when we keep all of these and intersections in mind, particularly within the context of an organization, that is called intentional inclusion. Given that, as we mentioned, 95% of hobbies are hidden, it is imperative that we practice intentional inclusion because we cannot know someone's identities by looking at them or even by interacting with them. So it is critically important to create environments where people feel comfortable revealing what their identities are so that they can bring their whole selves into the work or learning environment. The culture is the total accumulation of the many beliefs, customs, activities, institutions, and communication patterns of an identifiable group of people. Notice the use of the expression, identifiable group of people. Often, that culture may only be identifiable to those who are members of that culture. Remember, we talked a bit about um, a parental culture of which those who are parents may be more aware than people who aren't parents. So parental culture includes beliefs, customs, activities, institutions, and communication patterns of that identifiable group of people. The same may also be the case with re re regional culture. And so there is a definitive Idaho culture, much like there is an American culture. So it is important to understand organiz organizational culture, which are the values, the beliefs, and norms of an organization in order to practice intentional inclusion within an organization. Ideally, if one's organizational culture is clear and defined, that culture should be expressed in the policies, programs, practices, and people of an organization. Organizational culture is important for intentional inclusion. When one is trying to create an intentionally inclusive environment that takes into account diversity, equity, inclusion, access, and justice, one needs both an understanding of the organization's cultures, values, beliefs, and norms, and the individual cultures of the people within the organization. With these two types of culture in mind, we can create specific considerations for diversity, equity, inclusion, and access towards policies, programs, practices, and people. The proverbial cultural iceberg graphic display can be used as a visual to demonstrate a quote by Peter Drucker that says that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. So looking at the iceberg, you will notice that above the waterline resides surface culture. This includes artifacts of tradition and custom like food, flags, festivals, holidays, music, performances, language, literature, and all of those that are a manifestation of the deep culture that exists below the cultural icebergs waterline. Often, when we talk about cultural celebrations or an introductory exploration of culture, we are referring to things that are part of surface culture, which are above the icebergs waterline. However, part of what its strategy for breakfast is this deep culture. Those things like communication styles and rules that include facial expressions, gestures, and eye contact. It also includes norms such as personal space, body language, displays of emotion, and tone of voice. Something like these communication styles and norms may exist even in one's organizational culture, recognizable by those who are members of that organizational culture. Then we have norms related to concepts such as self, time, past and future, fairness, and justice. There are norms related to age, sex, class, and family. There are cultural notions of courtesy and manners, friendship, leadership, cleanliness, modesty, and beauty. Certainly, concepts of leadership, for example, could have a huge impact on infusing diversity, equity, and inclusion, and access for both organizational culture 
and for individual culture. Attitudes towards elders, adolescents, dependents, perspectives regarding work and authority, cooperation versus competition, relationship with animals, age, sin, and death will certainly have an impact on members of your team and the culture that they bring to the workplace. And finally, approaches to religion, courtship, marriage, and raising children, including perspectives on decision-making and problem-solving, can have a significant impact on creating an inclusive organizational culture that takes into account the individual cultures of team or organizational members. The point we're trying to make here is that when one seeks to address diversity, equity, and inclusion and access, you can't stop at engaging the surface culture because you are neglecting the sources of these cultural norms. Such an approach could lead to limited perspectives and can derail an otherwise feasible cultural inclusion strategy. Now we turn to a perspective that can help us achieve intentional inclusion within our organizational cultures, and that is cultural competence. Cultural competence comes before cultural humility. Cultural competence is the idea that one can become all-knowing in other cultures. Yet this perspective is often based on academic knowledge rather than lived experience. So cultural competence often looks like skill building and working towards an end goal that can be achieved through knowledge and training. However, this approach supports the myth that culture does not change or evolve. As we know, culture changes and evolves over time. Cultural humility is therefore more useful when infusing diversity, equity, inclusion, and access to working and learning environments. Cultural humility has no end goal or definitive result. It's a concept that emerged from the medical community in the late 20th century. It invites a lifelong learning journey and commitment to continuous improvements that involves introspection, co-learning, and the willingness to learn from everyone, not just those with positional power, authority, or title. In the teaching and learning environment, cultural humility allows for diminished power dynamics so that all members of a learning environment, whether they are students, faculty, staff, or administrators, have relative positional power. This also has application to working environments where every interaction is an opportunity for awareness. A perspective such as this is certainly a shift from those, from those of us conditioned to look only to authority figures such as teachers, faculty, and diversity and inclusion practitioners as the keepers of knowledge. In an academic setting, one might believe that only teachers are facilitators of, no, of knowledge and learning. This misses a great opportunity to learn from our students' perspectives and lived experiences. So when students realize they are an active part of the learning process just by showing up, it increases their engagement and, level, and levels the educational playing field for historically minoritized students. In a work setting, it values everyone's contributions to a culture of inclusion by considering individual perspectives as part of the process. Cultural humility allows culturally competent individuals to identify the presence and importance of differences between their orientation and that of each person they interact with, and to explore compromises that would be acceptable to both. You will notice in this definition of cultural humility that it references cultural competence. So cultural humility presumes some level of cultural competence as the first step toward cultural humility is identifying the presence and importance of differences. This relatively new 21st century concept is different from the 20th century notion that affirmed differences were to be avoided because of the level of discomfort they may cause. You may have heard people say, I don't see color, or I don't see you as a black woman, or I treat everyone the same. The reality is, if you don't see me as a black man, you don't acknowledge the differences between my perspectives, lived experiences and interactions and yours. We want to affirm that it is okay to identify and acknowledge differences between yourself and those with whom you interact. Because if we pretend that we are exactly the same, 
then we are not able to explore the kinds of compromises that are acceptable to diverse groups of people. And we are unable to practice equity over equality. So in order to realize the benefits of a diverse environment, we must engage in a lifelong process of self-reflection and self-critique. I like to use the metaphor of a mirror. Cultural competence is turning the mirror outward and learning more about other groups and individuals. While knowledge of these cultural generalizations are useful, this supports the idea that culture is static rather than dynamic and that a list can provide all relevant information. Cultural humility turns the mirror on ourselves and asks us to think about how our differences affect our perspectives. Why? So that we can begin to see differences without judgment and to just see differences as just different and having awareness of our own biases and assumptions. Cultural humility prompts us to ask ourselves, why did I make this particular assumption about this particular person, place, or thing? Is it because I'm relying on a list of predetermined values and beliefs and communication patterns of an identifiable group of people? In other words, cultural competence? Should I instead look at myself and think about how I might increase my own awareness of my identities and how they affect my perspectives and lived experiences to interact better with other people? So here we see a table that compares cultural competence and cultural humility. And like we mentioned, cultural competence has to do with the idea that one can become knowledgeable in other cultures. While in cultural humility, there's really no end goal or a definitive result. And cultural competence is based on academic acquisition. With humility, cultural humility is about lifelong learning and continuous improvement. And cultural competence promotes skill building and working toward an end goal. Cultural humility diminishes power dynamics and all have relative positional power. Next, we'll, we'll discuss how to engage with cultural humility by identifying your place on the awareness continuum. The awareness continuum is a way of synthesizing diversity or difference with inclusion and cultural humility. You will notice that the first place or stage is not yet on the continuum. That is being ignorant or oblivious. So the stage of ignorance and oblivion. Let's talk a bit about the difference between ignorance and oblivion. Oblivion is not knowing what you don't know or even that there are things you are supposed to know about difference. Ignorance, however, is operating on limited information and presuming that it is facts and that is very accurate. The difference between ignorance and willful oblivion is that willful oblivion suggests that you know there is more to learn, but you refuse to receive that information because it might take you out of your comfort zone. Yes, it's, you know what, I'm good. I know that it's better for me to have more awareness, but I'm not comfortable with being com with being uncomfortable in order to adapt to that awareness. So that's why it's called willful oblivion. This may happen as people engage with different concepts such as privilege and so on. Rather than seeking uh, or receiving information such as statistics or other factual data that may help to provide more understanding, deniers of privilege would rather accept the limited information they have, which they are comfortable with, and reject additional information that may cause them cognitive dissonance, which can be uncomfortable. In truth, learning about different perspectives and lived experiences is expected to induce a level of cognitive dissonance because it may be unfamiliar. It's just part of the growth process. You will notice the first place on the continuum is actually awareness. Awareness includes awareness of different perspectives and lived experiences, and also self-awareness. Remember the mirror we talked about in order to practice cultural humility. The next place on the continuum is tolerance. 
We tolerate things that we don't like, but know that we have to put up with out of necessity. But who would want to be merely tolerated? So when a person says they are tolerant or practicing tolerance, that's not really doing a whole lot. What's worse, most people can tell when they are being tolerated rather than being sought to be understood. The key here is that we often tolerate things that we don't understand. So increasing understanding can help us move forward on the continuum, away from tolerance. Understanding gets us closer to that deep culture that we talked about, the underbelly of the iceberg below the waterline. The last stage on the continuum is acceptance and appreciation. In order to get to a point of acceptance and appreciation of difference, we have to do more than simply understand the person, place, or thing as is different. We have to accept and appreciate the value this difference brings to our community or organization. That's when you can truly start applying the principles of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. Because you first acknowledge the difference, seek to understand it, and accept and appreciate the value the difference can add. Now we turn our attention to empathy as a companion to cultural humility. Empathy is defined as the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Empathy is a tool that can help us to make connections, thereby improving our approach to cultural humility. There are three types of empathy. Cognitive empathy, which is knowing how another person feels and what they may be thinking. This is also known as perspective taking or putting oneself in someone else's shoes. Emotional empathy is physically feeling along with someone else as if those emotions were contagious. Those who identify as empaths have this ability and often find it difficult to dissociate their own feelings from others. Compassionate empathy is the root of change agency. It's understanding a person's predicament to the point of being moved if necessary. This is the first step to allyship, advocacy, and accomplishment. Think about the identities you find most salient that have the most impact on your perspectives, experiences, and interactions. Wouldn't you want someone to have empathy for you? To understand how your lived experiences influence your perspectives? To not have those perspectives nullified because of ignorance, willful oblivion, or a lack of willingness to understand. Empathy can, quite frankly, make us better humans. It's something we should be conscious of practicing with each other and really makes a difference to those on the receiving end of it. Empathy pairs well with cultural humility and gets us one step closer to intentionally inclusive environments. Let's consider the application of these concept, concepts to the environments in which we work and live. First, self-awareness of our own perspectives can help us to be more aware of others' hidden perspectives and yields more intentionally inclusive environments. This intentionally inclusive environment leads to increased engagement where members of your community feel safe bringing their whole selves to work and contribute to psychological safety. Here are some questions to ask yourself. Can everyone in your organization bring their whole selves to work? How do you know? Have you asked what elements of deep culture of your organization's members may affect your organizational culture? That said, can you define your organizational culture? Is your organization guided by tolerance of difference or are there efforts to practice intentional inclusion through active understanding leading towards acceptance and appreciation of differences? In doing so, are you able to realize the full benefits of a diverse organization? These essential questions encourage practical application of these concepts in our respective environments. Thank you and see you in the two.